All righty. Um, well, welcome to session four of the IO Ideas Conference. I'm your moderator, Marissa Payne. The session, The Role of Arts and Culture in Community Placemaking, is within the Arts and Culture track. Uh, we'll be talking about how, uh, how the arts can help inform or tell the stories of Iowa neighborhoods, and we'll look at what steps communities consider when building a distinct welcoming space. Our time together will include talking with our panelists and addressing audience questions. All of our sessions have closed captioning access and all of our sessions are being recorded. Uh, please audience members, if you have a question, um, I ask that you share it as soon as possible and uh, you know, don't hold on to a good question until the end. Uh, you know, once we get down to the final few minutes, um, there's not as much time left and I just wanna be sure I'm able to incorporate as many of your uh, brilliant questions as possible. Um, so with, with that noted, um, I'll let the panelists introduce themselves. Um, I'll just start with the first on my screen here, uh, Christopher. Sure. My name is Christopher Hunter and I'm the director of special events at the Iowa City Downtown District. We're um, a SMID district, a self-supported municipal improvement district, um, kind of like a business improvement district. So we do a lot of initiatives and programs to help support that area and the businesses within our community. Thank you. Tiffany? Hi, all. I'm Tiffany Tauschek, and uh, I wear a couple of different hats. I'm the president of Downtown DSM, Inc., which is a subsidiary of the Greater Des Moines Partnership. For the partnership, I wear the hat of uh, COO. So at the partnership, we're a regional community development and economic development organization representing 10 counties. Um, and really excited about this conversation today. I've been working in placemaking on some small scale and large scale projects uh, through Downtown DSM, Greater Des Moines Partnership, and also a past board member of uh, Bravo Greater Des Moines, an arts and culture organization in our community. Thank you, Monica. Uh, my name is Monica Leo, <clears throat> excuse me. And I'm with Oil and Spiegel Puppet Theater in West Liberty, Iowa, <clears throat> excuse me. We have all glass puppetry center here. Uh, we bring in puppeteers from all over the world actually for different events. And we also present our own activities and events here. We were the co-founders and still manage every year the West Liberty Children's Festival, uh, which has been going on for 25 years and which has become one of the two major events in town every year. Um, brings in three to 4,000 people, which isn't shabby for a community of 3,700. Uh, we uh, co-founded the West Liberty Area Arts Council, which has become a major factor in the town. When we first got our puppetry center here in 1995, this was not known as an arts community, and now it is, and I think we've played a role in that. Awesome, thank you, and John. Hello everyone, I'm uh, John Berg. I'm program manager for arts and community development with the Ar Iowa Arts Council. We are the State Arts Agency, which is a division of the Iowa Department of Cultural Affairs. So in my role, I work with about uh, 60 different communities throughout the state um, that hold our designations that are uh, the Iowa Great Places designation, as well as the Iowa Cultural and Entertainment Districts designation. I also manage a few different programs statewide that focus on creative placemaking and have uh, been involved with community development and placemaking activities uh, within uh, Iowa and Indianapolis, Indiana for about 12 years now. So I'm excited for this conversation and I look forward to connecting with you all. Yeah, thank you. So as you all see, we have um, you know, a variety of perspective perspectives on this panel, so it should be a good conversation. Um, to start off, let's just establish, you know, when we say placemaking, um, what do we mean for this panel and you know, specifically placemaking uh, using arts and culture? Whoever can jump in first. I see it as a way to tie the identity of the community, like our community, for instance, is uh, over 50% Latino and um, arts and culture is a big part of their heritage. And I see it as a way to tie the people who are in the community and their arts heritage uh, to the way it is, you know, to, to where they have come and, and who they deal with. 
I think we kind of use it for the district, using it as a way to strengthen our, some economic development and encourage people to engage with the community and making downtown as a destination to come and visit and offering, showcasing what's there to offer and using different ways of placemaking by like showcasing the local artists that are here in the community and using those local resources to highlight them. Um, so with the Iowa Arts Council, we use creative placemaking as our lane, if you will, which puts arts, culture, and heritage at the center of community and economic development efforts. Um, in practice, successful placemaking uh, can include a range of assets and public spaces connected to cultural, recreational, and entertainment uses. But we often hear other terms, placemaking in general is just the effective use of public space, um, utilizing um, those, those types of ideas. There are different terminology that we also hear, such as, such as strategic, strategic placemaking, tactical placemaking, but within the IAC and DCA, we look at this from a creative placemaking effort, which lifts up um, those authentic qualities and utilizes arts and culture at, at the center. And we, we define placemaking as what creates a unique sense of place to connect people with that place. Uh, and then specifically, again, um, for placemaking projects, we've, we've done large working on multi-year uh, placemaking projects as well as small, uh, more of the lighter, quicker, cheaper model of placemaking to really just reinforce that connection of people and place through art. Uh, we find and believe that um, art in particular and working with artists from the very, very beginning of a project or an idea really does uh, act as a really great convener and way of solving problems and bringing people together in a unique way for that, that community in an authentic way. Yeah, and so when we're talking about, you know, what makes a place a unique place, um, you know, what's kind of um, some of the qualities that are a common thread in making a place a destination that people want to come to and how can creative placemaking elevate or uh, call attention to a community's unique existing assets, um, you know, to really make it more of a destination. I think it's important to make it like a welcoming environment. You want to invite anyone to come into that space and make them feel comfortable there, whether that's through clean and safe initiatives or like something to catch their eye, maybe something they won't normally be able to interact with in their community that they can on a day-to-day -day basis. So bringing that special event in or that special public art installation or new mural to have them walk by and just kind of surprise their eye. We found it really interesting to hook into the history and also the identity of our community and selecting some of the material we performed. We we unearthed the fact that this was an important location for John Brown and the place that he um, sent some enslaved people on the train, the only example of the train being part of the Underground Railroad. When we found that out, we wrote two shows about it and now people in town that hadn't realized that at the time are all aware of it. So I see it as, and we've done bilingual shows to include the Latino population. I see it as a way to hook into the things that are specific about our community and, and um, showcase them. We've been working on a downtown vision planning process, which is looking um, and thinking through what our downtown, um, downtown Des Moines look like in the next 15 to 20 years. And what is it that we need for downtown in the next 15 to 20 years? And this has been a, um, a community driven process. Uh, it's the most inclusive plan that our, our downtown has had. And um, a key component of that, of course, is placemaking. And we uh, define it and have identified a, a vision and, and, and through this planning process, which is an inclusive space uh, for welcome surprises. And uh, so the welcome surprises component, I think to me also speaks to that placemaking component of 
somewhere you could go like a district or a place to shop, a place to eat and have a welcome surprise. Uh, perhaps it's um, something that an artist has created that a mural that's there. It's um, hidden ornaments that are created uh, by artists and hidden in the trees that you uh, walk by and you can grab one of the ornaments for free as you're walking into your lo local coffee shop. But those unique experiences experiences that really help tie together not only the existing infrastructure and small businesses, but also that um, authentic street feel and tying it back to those local artists through through support of projects like that. So we have numerous projects like that that we've that we've been working on, but um, the welcome surprises component, I think, is one that uh, is is unique to to our downtown. That's nice. I like that. I think I think to build on to build on to the others uh, and Christopher's point earlier, you know, we look for communities to really define those spaces and to develop them with the community rather than for the community. So really taking um, stock of what the community's assets are and bringing forth stakeholders to really dream about what is the history of this area? What is uh, what are some things that and the assets that really could be brought forward? Uh, but also, you know, taking some risks, thinking about um, what would really transport someone to a, a place that um, it, it, they can really be proud of because, you know, they live in the community every day. They want to show it off to people as an excuse to bring people there as visitors and maybe even to live there one day. So, um, but it, you don't want to try to recreate something that belongs in another community or might is just copying it. You want to be authentic to the, the community's true self. Yeah, to that point, um, I mean, from your vantage point around the state, you know, what are some examples that you've seen of communities, um, you know, really doing well with kind of um, using that authentic approach of engaging the community that's there to then like, you know, create something that reflects, you know, the, the people that are going to be living with the art every day. Oh, my, you want me to go ahead and take that one? <laughs> yeah, you're welcome to take that first. Um, some of the uh, examples, and I want to be too care. I want to be careful here because uh, we, you know, want to celebrate projects and activities throughout the state. Um, one thing, one project that comes to mind is the Waterloo Center for the Arts and their campus, which connects a lot of different assets within their community, including the amphitheater, Expo Plaza and infrastructure um, connected through uh, intentional programming, kind of like what Tiffany was talking about, um, which creates a, a community and strengthens sense of place. What they also did through that is engage youth and over 200 people plus 150 young artists to um, really connect with the community and learn about stories and the history of Waterloo. Um, there's a group in Waterloo called the Youth Art Team, which uh, did a project called Our Freedom Story that uh, centered around the stories and history of Waterloo and its residents. And out of that, uh, constructed a 3,000 plus square foot mural along the flood wall, um, the Cedar River, by the Waterloo Center for the Arts. And what that does is it allows youth to connect to older residents. It creates that connection between them and it creates a product that the youth and the community can be proud of. Um, and the youth can even see themselves staying in that community, knowing that they, uh, they had a significant part uh, of that project. Um, it's a retention tool. So I think that, that in that case, it's a good example of engaging youth in the community and actually having them be a part of the project. I can share an example uh, from, from Des Moines, Greater Des Moines. We, about eight years ago, so it's been a while, and I think that's um, part of the beauty with placemaking projects too, is that you can be innovative and uh, it's okay to try things out and maybe they do or don't work, <laughs> but um, giving ourselves that freedom to, uh, to try something new. We, um, about eight years ago, partnered, it was a public-private partnership, a group of volunteers came together to create and organize the art route. And the art route is a, um, an area that connects um, a number, more than 90 different public works of art in our downtown area. 
through painted pathways, uh, dots that connect you to those different uh, pieces of art that you can that you can easily see and experience. And we also um, had crosswalks painted, and these uh, crosswalks were areas specifically that were determined to be more dangerous. There were more uh, pedestrian car and um, bike car accidents happening in these, uh, in these um, intersections. So uh, research shows that when you have art, public art, and specifically painted uh, public arts on busy intersections that helps slow down traffic, it's a traffic calming strategy. So we were able to, uh, again, partner with a number of entities, including uh, the city and Public Art Foundation, Bravo Greater Des Moines Community Foundation, and, and many companies to come together to, to raise money for this, uh, for this special project, uh, which has um, some components that are still living on and some components that aren't. But I think that goes back to the point, too, of having many different stakeholders and input points across the way so that you're building something together and identifying opportunities to solve problems in the community through creative placemaking. I can talk about some new things that we've done at the downtown district. So we have the downtown pedestrian mall, which is a big open area surrounding some of our businesses. In the last two summers, we brought some pretty big public art installations into that space, just to kind of help bring people downtown and give them a whole new experience. Um, this last summer, we brought the Mikasa Yurikasa. And I, let me give some background, I guess. These public art installations are from Montreal. So they're traveling international public art installations. And I know Des Moines has brought a couple to the downtown there as well. And they're pretty big. There's something unique that you never see. And they use the local artists from those areas out in Montreal. And we specifically brought Mikasa Yurikasa to Iowa City and these, these big lead framed houses with swings that the attendees can swing on. We had it there for about a month through the month of July, and we saw a lot of interaction and positive engagement with those. Um, we did partner with some local enti entities as well, such as the Community Foundation of Johnson County. And with that shape of that red house, we kind of played off of that and used that as a local initiative to um, support local housing initiatives. So we tied that to um, social media use and the people using the hashtags there and donating a dollar for every hashtag that was used. And we saw a great response from that. Yeah, no, I, I myself am a University of Iowa graduate. So I, I know like pre-2020 um, Ped Mall in Iowa City and um, even just in the last couple of years, it's like really taken off. So yeah, impressive things going on in Iowa City. Um, yeah, I guess like two, uh, the next question, what would you all say is the importance of investing in arts and culture specifically to help um, strengthen community bonds and create a sense of togetherness that you've all kind of touched on as, um, you know, the purpose of placemaking and um, how have you seen it be used to make those connections? I can jump in and get it started. Uh, so I think part of the beauty of um, working working with artists and also working on creative placemaking is that it does help provide a real and authentic sense of belonging for individuals that are part of that process and contributing to that process. Uh, so which which we all know is very very important, and I think we could all highlight a number of different projects that where. Um, we did some things right and probably opportunities we learned from as well along along the way, but um, also wanted to share the, a data point from our partners and friends over at Bravo Greater Des Moines, just as it relates to the economic impact of arts and culture on, on our community. So we know that um, certainly arts, culture, placemaking, this is not just a nice to have amenity. This, this has a true real impact on people's lives mm -hmm. in a very meaningful way. And some data points um, to back that up from uh, the, the Bravo Greater Des Moines uh, Regional Economy Study. Um, there was $185 million in spending through this, through this study. It, it was identified also there are more than 5,600 individuals that have full-time jobs in this sector, the arts culture sector in Greater Des Moines, and more than $16.8 million in government revenue that comes because of the arts and culture 
um, community and industry overall. So not only are we impacting uh, lives on a daily basis, it's impacting the economy in a really meaningful way. So it's something to keep in mind um, that, uh, that this, this goes very deep, arts and culture, and tying that back through placemaking, community placemaking, creative placemaking is incredibly important to community growth and development. I, I would maybe piggyback on that. I know that we're all about looking at reports and uh, figuring out what um, leads to attracting skilled workforce and uh, increasing population in the state of Iowa and in our rural communities. And I think uh, we're looking in now to the Envision Iowa report that just came out um, and looking at some of the elements of arts and culture being key to creating social vibrancy and a welcoming feel to newcomers and existing residents within communities. But I think too that we should be considering how we are looking at our definitions of economic development and how modernizing the terms and roles that arts and culture play in it. So whether it's, it's so much more beyond an amenity to consider arts and culture as part of the fabric of communities. And we should be more talking more as looking at this as a cultural economy rather than an, an amenity. So a part of that is finding ways to demonstrate the, the hard value adds of arts and culture versus the last thing that you put into something like the cherry on top, if you will and having it be more involved in all aspects of community development, community redevelopment. Um, and so that's a part of what we're looking at and, and our approach across the state. Christopher or Monica, did you have anything to add? Well, I think it's incredibly important. I mean, <clears throat> we do as many projects as we can that bring in community members to, to work on them. We do an annual community puppet show that we invite people to help perform and help build in the first place. And um, we, you know, we, we are involved in bringing music into the downtown park and we're involved in the, in the renovation of the downtown park in the first place. I think those kind of things are incredibly important. And I know personally of people that have moved to West Liberty because they came and liked the things that were available there that actually weren't available before we started the puppetry center because there was nobody there to really promote it. I would just second what they all said to you. I just think it's important to have those moments where you can create those connections even for the artists to share, but even for the community to share and come interact with either what those events are or those programs. And they may be from different backgrounds, but they're sharing that same experience in that same place and in that moment. And I feel like with ours, like little things that we do, like we have all of our benches in our pet mall and we have those painted each year. So every year, I know the community looks forward to seeing those new designs that come out from the local artists. Some of them are students at the University of Iowa, some are students from the high school and just giving those opportunities and giving them a voice and kind of showcasing them. Um, and then that just invites the community to come down and sit on those benches and they may be strangers, but they probably feel more inclined to sit next to each other just because of that welcoming environment. I think it's just important to have those little seeds throughout. Yeah, um, and to expand on something that a couple of you touched on, just like from the economic development standpoint or um, you know, workforce recruitment and retention, um, especially as we emerge from the COVID-19 pandemic, still um, you know, workforce is such a key issue and we just can't find enough workers to fill those open jobs in Iowa. Um, so what, what role do you see uh, creative placemaking having in um, recruitment and retention of talent? And, um, you know, e even though it might not be the most obvious investment that people think to make in addressing uh, the workforce issues we're having, um, you know, what, what would kind of be your sales pitch to communities to like make, make that a priority? I think it's major. I mean, I'm, of course, I'm prejudiced, but I'd be way more likely to move to a community that had a vibrant arts um, scene. And I think that an awful lot of people are, whether or not they're personally involved in the arts. 
It makes the place more colorful and more interesting to live in. It gives you something to brag about to your relatives. We conducted, um, the Greater Des Moines Partnership conducted a workforce trends and occupancy study uh, with Baton Global and Rework. And through that study, uh, we um, asked 5,200 knowledge workers in the Greater Des Moines area about what it would take to help draw them back into the office and what it would help draw them back into um, spending more time in our downtown. And what was interesting is the top three reasons that people will want to go into work and into the office um, per the study, so hyper-local data. Um, number one is the social connect connectivity and networking opportunity that you can get from um, being in a special place or office. Uh, the second is outdoor recreation opportunities. And the third is cultural amenities and access to arts and culture in particular. So as you think about how do we help entice individuals to stay connected, have that, again, that sense of belonging in a community, having that connectivity through cultural amenities, quality of life amenities, arts culture is incredibly important. Um, through that same study, we also learned that of those surveyed, 86% said that they would be more willing to spend more time, more money in our downtown if we were to invest further in arts culture um, amenities and offerings. So we've really been leaning in to that as, um, again, more of those pop-up activations. Uh, we call them surprise and delight moments where we can help um, help create those opportunities for individuals that are visiting our downtown or perhaps living downtown or working downtown to experience downtown in a new and different way while also still encouraging them to support our local and small businesses because um, they need us too. So uh, from a workforce perspective, it's just been, it's been really interesting. We have data that indicates that these um, pop-up activations, which are absolutely arts culture centered, working with local artists, that that is driving more traffic downtown. And we are averaging currently in downtown Des Moines, 78% of pre-pandemic levels as it relates to foot traffic. And the national average is 44%. So certainly we have a long way to go, but feeling good that um, we know that people want access to those arts, culture, uh, amenities, and activations, and they're willing to travel to get to them. And uh, like Monica said, it's it just makes it better. Everybody's looking for vibrancy and ways to connect and um, pleased that we have some data to back up that it does work. Uh, we just need to keep leaning into it. I would piggyback off of what Tiffany and Monica said. and. When you have multiple activities and maybe some of those arts and culture leisure activities, that adds to that quality of life and it definitely makes people feel more like they belong in that space and in that city and in that town. And with that, when people feel a sense of belonging, they're more inclined to support maybe those arts and culture venues and those activities or even volunteer at some of those events where people may need that help. And the more you have it and the more reassuring it is, I think the more comfortable people will be to participate. And, and I think from our perspective, taking uh, a look at some of the communities that we work with um, in the rural parts of the state, I think that placemaking plays a critical role in not only um, building up and offering opportunities for businesses along Main Street to be uh, further engaged through events that are run through districts. So we think about um, Earlham, Iowa and their music festival um, several events uh, on the western part of the state um, in Woodbine. I mean, communities like that are um, using placemaking and events and programming to continually uh, support and drive uh, revenue into their Main Street businesses. And also in communities like Malvern, Iowa, that we work with, um, they are becoming a regional destination for folks from Omaha, for example. And so their, embrace, their embracement or embracing of creative placemaking, uh, installing arts within their downtown Main Street and having installations along the trail that runs through there definitely leads to them being quote unquote on the map in terms of a regional destination in a smaller community, um, but really allowing them to build a sense of pride in their place. Yeah, 
Excellent. So in, um, in all your lines of work, um, are there success stories that you've seen of cities or uh, neighborhoods using arts and culture to uh, kind of spur new life and reinvestment into their communities after periods of disinvestment or decline? Yeah, I'll tell you about our little downtown park. It's not much. It's just in between two buildings where a building came down. When we first came to West Liberty, they called it a park, but it was really a trash hole. Uh, the sort of the local teenage thugs hung out there and the whole place was covered with broken glass because they would drink pop or if they could get away with it beer and throw the bottle when they got done and everybody kind of kept away from there. And I was on the chamber board at the time and uh, somebody suggested that maybe we should renovate that space and put a stage in there and bleachers and turn it into a little performing space. And almost everybody said, oh no, those kids will just trash it again. But I'd worked with kids enough by that time to know that no, if the place is nice, they won't trash it, they'll take care of it. They trash it because it's already a trash hole. And so uh, we decided as a group to go ahead and do that. And now it's a lovely little performing space with a semicircular stage and tables and chairs and bleachers. And it has become um, a destination for regional puppeteers to perform at it during our children's festival because we always bring in guest puppet troops. We, we did our, our whole performing season there during COVID when we couldn't gather indoors. Um, we bring music into that park every Friday night in August and it has become just a local, uh, a local little treasure. People love it. It's got really nice acoustics. At any day of the week, if the weather is halfway decent, you'll walk through there and somebody will be eating their lunch or talking to friends or something like that. And um, no, it never turned into a trash hole again. I haven't seen a broken bottle there in 20 years. I can share a couple of other uh, examples um, from our community. Um, one would be we uh, hosted a silent disco. Uh, we closed down some streets in downtown. Um, hosted, we actually are hosting it again tomorrow night. If anybody wants to make the trip to Des Moines for a silent disco, it's free and open to all. And um, part of part of the reason we wanted to host the the silent disco and um, and, and close some of those streets was to help slow down traffic. Um, we were uh, experiencing through, through COVID actually, there were um, multiple cars that were going faster than the speed limits through certain areas of our downtown and wanted to disrupt that pattern. Um, and again, only a short-term solution, but it did help, um, it did help disrupt pattern, uh, uh, the traffic patterns for a short time. So. Again, I think it's just a reminder that um, there are all kinds of opportunities to help solve short-term or long-term problems when, when we're leveraging creative placemaking and, and fun ideas together. So uh, that, was, that was one. Um, and then another was uh, similar to what Christopher was talking about uh, with um, the swings. We had uh, Creos that we partnered with on eight foot tall, hourglasses that were placed in an area in the historic East Village in downtown that um, they it was available open for six weeks, 24 seven in an area that was a parking lot uh, right outside of City Hall that was um, not very attractive and not being utilized. Um, so we really brought that to life through through these hourglass experiences where people could uh, turn the wheel and have these massive hourglasses light up, play music, and it was very experiential. And it helped um, too from just a word of mouth perspective and really creating some more FOMO, some of that fear of missing out. There were individuals that were stopping by, um, a ton of students actually, kids were stopping by, high school students, um, stopping by to, to play with these hourglasses and they would post about it on social media, their friends would see it. And so then there would be even more um, students that would come down the next evening to, to participate and word really helped spread, which brought more people to downtown, which of course is what we were looking for is to, to make downtown more vibrant and draw more people downtown overall. So um, 
creative ideas, vibrancy, um, and then of course working with artists whenever possible from the very beginning. Uh, just can't overstate that how important that is uh, because they see opportunities that maybe um, maybe we would not. They um, many of the artists we've worked with identify really unique ideas and and ways to to solve problems. Um, oh, go ahead, Christopher. Sorry. No, you can go ahead. No worries. Um, I, I would reiterate that you don't always need to have um, a national traveling exhibit um, or installation. So, so in some communities that we work with, including uh, Manning and Malvern, they've actually utilized local fabricators to do a lot of this work. And so don't, uh, you know, that goes back to asset mapping and knowing, you know, getting a sense of what your community partners work on. Sometimes they can even, you know, come in at cost or low cost to produce things if you're involving an artist on the front end um, to produce, you know, that welcome signage or installations within a community. But keep in mind that the visual additions like a mural, of course, a, a sustainability plan on that mural and making sure that you're following appropriate historical guidelines, watching what you're putting it on, et cetera. Um, but a mural can completely change a space. If I think of communities like Oskaloosa and Jefferson uh, and a lot, of, a lot of communities across the state that have made, made major authentic investments into spaces like alleys um, to transform them into vibrant spaces that are ac activated and programmed throughout in a thoughtful way. And just think about it. If a 12 foot wide space, uh, either a side or back alley can be transformed into a third place, then the sky's the limit. Just think about those spaces that you know, from, from big to small, think about incremental ways um, where folks, artists, and the community can be engaged to create that authentic sense of place. Awesome. Going on kind of what you were saying, John, um, I mean, we've had such success and we have loved those traveling Creos installations and we've grown to like them and it's kind of expected that we may have them each we're now getting used to it, but we are also looking at ways to involve our local community and the people we have to make stuff like that possible. So we are in the works of doing, reaching out to like groups at the University of Iowa and the students there and the people who are experts in those areas, maybe with like um, projection mapping and stuff and creating like light installations. So we are in the process of doing that currently for hopefully an upcoming winter festival that we may have in the coming years. Um, and I was gonna say, going into that, winter is always a hard time in Iowa. So getting people to come outside and be downtown in our community can always be difficult because no one wants to get out in the cold. So we try to do, are working on ways to create something fun and inviting for people to come down during those cold months. And I've seen other communities do similar things like in Grand Rapids in Michigan, they had the World of Winter Festival where they brought tons of public art installations and events like the silent disco outside during those months. And it's been great success. So we are looking at ways to do something very similar hopefully soon. Yeah, thank you all for those examples. Um, we do have a couple audience questions that I want to get to. Um, I'll start with this one. Um, one attendee asks, uh, what role does accessibility play in your work? What conversations do you have while planning projects or events? conversations about uh, about um, accessibility <clears throat> generally or about physical accessibility or you know I think there's a lot of different ways to interpret accessibility so we try to make our projects physically accessible but also just creatively accessible to people whether or not they feel like they're artists we try to make them we try to help them discover the the, not, the artists that they didn't know about inside, along with um, making sure we have physical uh, accessibility. We try to keep all of our events um, that are um, more of those public events free, uh, free, open to all. Um, anytime we create uh, a, a pop-up activation, for example, we're, we're hiring and working with local artists and 
placing those those items that the artists that we've paid the artists for, placing those out in the public to be taken for free, um, trying trying to do we all all that we can to help connect our um, our local locals with those artists um, with with us um, covering those costs um, and helping build some bridges to help inspire and uh, create additional vibrancy. I hope that we're answering the question the way it was intended. On that, on that note, we decided this year for the last few months, we've been not charging, not selling tickets to family events, but asking for donations instead, because the cost is just as high for us, whether we're um, selling tickets or not. We've discovered that so far, almost to the dollar, we get the same amount in donations as we would have gotten if everybody would have bought a ticket. They just come in different, in different, you know, I mean, some people give more, obviously, and some don't give any, but come right out to the same amount, which I think is fascinating. Cool. Um, yeah, kind of pivoting, um, how can communities embed creative place making into community planning? Um, I mean, I think in our conversation before this, we talked about Cedar Rapids as an example. Um, we just adopted a public art uh, master plan here and the Economic Alliance is a local entity that's really done a lot to um, add to our public art here in Cedar Rapids. And um, I'm sure you all have other examples. Um, yeah, the, the Cedar Rapids plan and other public art master plans are a part of the equation, I guess. Um, hiring individuals at the city level to focus on um, arts and culture within a, a municipality. So Dubuque, um, Iowa City, um, Fort Dodge, they, they have folks that are helping to steward that, those plans. Um, I know that those individuals are really overworked in their work because they're trying to do a lot of different things, but it, at least you know that the, from, a lot, from a larger perspective when it comes to events, when it comes to supportive artists in developing these spaces, developing um, a cohesive arts and culture strategy. Thank you for visiting the State Historical Sorry, we, uh, I work in a museum and that's what happens at 3.59, 4 o'clock. Uh, so yeah, just finding folks to, to focus on those and steward those plans from paper to implementation. Sorry about that. No problem. I think I've had my Outlook notify me of emails a couple of times, it happens. Did anyone else have any other examples? Uh, just going back to our downtown DSM future forward vision plan and action plan, um, we heard from from the community uh, and uh, loud way how important placemaking is to them. It rose up as one of the themes, and as we're starting to work towards adoption of this plan through city council and moving that forward, um, there are multiple initiatives that will be shared publicly soon that. Um, that are um, creative placemaking um, centered. And again, this, this came through input of about 8,000 individuals um, throughout the community that were, um, were in, in invited, asked to participate. And we really worked hard to get out into the neighborhoods, making sure that we were meeting people where they were to hear their input and thoughts on what the future of downtown could and should look like and invited them to participate in that entire journey throughout, throughout the process uh, to get us to where, where we are landing. Uh, so it will be exciting to see the, the plan uh, finalize and some elements of those plans come to life, but it is, um, it's clear that at least in, in our community that there is a real passion for creative placemaking and an understanding of, of its importance. And I know one well, was trying to find a related question. Um, someone asked, um, 
I believe this started or this question came in before the panel. So hopefully this person is here. Um, but one person asks in 2019, the National League of Cities spoke about investing in skate parks and public art. Uh, these are projects that are usually not top of mind in city planning. What can be done to move them forward and change the mindset of their importance in culture building? Well, I'd say look at look at the Lordson Skate Park. It's the largest skate park in the United States, and it's in downtown Des Moines, right along the river. It was a vision that took about 18 years to really come to life, and it was because a small but mighty group of volunteers wouldn't give up. They saw this as a community need and an opportunity for kiddos and the future of our community to come together because skateboarding is known as a fairly accessible uh, activity. It's something that drives outdoor, being outdoors, getting off of devices away from computers and, um, and screens. So um, that was a, a massive public-private partnership and um, one of the one of the really exciting components of, of the skate park, in addition to again it being the largest in the country, uh, was the fact that we decided as as a um, committee that we wanted to ensure that there was skatable art woven into the the skate park. So not only is the skate park itself a work of art, we also worked with artists to create um, this massive uh, wow. It's, literally spelled W-O-W, -W, wow, sculpture that's skatable, that is something that you can see from street level, from sidewalk level, and then you can see it from the waters as we're working to activate our waterways through our Icon Water Trails project as well. So it's it's really become one of those iconic spaces to see and experience. Um, so I think looking at that as an example of, again, small but mighty group of people that just wouldn't give up, they believed and had the passion to keep pushing until um, until others were were uh, able to help and everybody pulling alongside each other to get this done. And that skate park hosted the 2021 Olympic trials, the Dew Tour and the Olympic trials, uh, just days after it had opened for the first time ever and hosted the Dew Tour again this last year. So there, there are examples like that. If, um, if individuals need data to back up their decision-making process, uh, there's data to back up that it's worth it and uh, the impact it's having on those on kids in that are wanting to get in, into that sport as well as just the community overall if you drive by that skate park any time of day between 6 a.m to 10 p.m you'll see it is very busy and it is a very diverse group of individuals that are experiencing the skate park whether they're on their skateboards on their scooters or they're sitting and, and watching and taking it all in I will say that Des Moines Skate Park is the envy of Cedar Rapids skaters. We're in the middle of uh, relocating our skate park for flood control. And someday, I know the city's planning a larger one, so then we'll have two. But for now, yeah. Does anyone else have anything else to add? I, th I think you can take advice from a large national organization like National League of Cities but at the end of the day, you, the community has to feel comfortable with that investment and it, ha, it should be authentic to them. I know that there are a handful of skate parks that I've seen around the state um, that are in various states of repair or disrepair. Obviously, Lordson is a crown jewel like nationally. Um, and plus there was some pretty significant programming uh, that went along with that, um, you know, 500 skateboards, probably more than that, were given to youth um, to have that be a part of their growing up. And so just keep in mind that you need to be all in on a project. Um, you just can't plop a skate park and then expect it to just work. It has to be really intentional and really authentic, whatever the project might be. Cool. Well, I know we're approaching the end of our time here, um, so I'll, I'll begin to wrap up. Um, since I since I picked on Cedar Rapids a little, I also have to brag about Cedar Rapids as the city reporter. Um, you know, we already mentioned the Cedar Rapids Public Art Master Plan, and you know, you know, something that plan did is set out 
Um, you know, not only is this a public priority for the city of Cedar Rapids, um, but it also called upon the private sector to, um, you know, contribute by making this investment in public art. Um, and as we've kind of emerged from the pandemic, Cedar Rapids has added a lot of new um, murals and we're beginning beginning to see, um, you know, even though downtown is still like not what it was before COVID, it's beginning to turn into something new with um, all the public art that's being added. So um, I'll get off my soapbox shortly, but you know, th that's what I've seen here in Cedar Rapids is, um, you know, public art and placemaking playing like such a key role in like the rebirth of something. Um, so for other community leaders watching this um, and, you know, community members, how can, what, what, what would we, what would be some of your takeaways for um, how to make similar investments in their own communities, uh, big or small going forward? In a small time, a town, a lot of times it ends up not being individual efforts by a few people, rather than being something that's, that, that there's a lot of funding support for. And in that case, what it takes is a lot of personal commitment. We have a lovely mural in town that the middle school art teacher took it upon herself to paint, got permission from the business owner and painted a beautiful mural on the side. And, and, and um, Got a bunch of volunteers to help her and it was really something that was informal i don't think she may have had some money to work with on the paints at least but it wasn't something that she got a big grant for or got a lot of public money for it was just something she decided to do and i think a lot of times that's the way these things happen somebody decides to do it i think you can't underestimate the importance of a plan because a lot of folks think that these projects just happen overnight and in a lot of ways larger projects can take up to 10 years to come to fruition so it really takes like monica was saying a dedicated group of individuals a plan and maybe a short timeline i don't know but you're it really comes down to the ability to develop a plan um, get a great group of folks around the table, public, private, you know, just regular folks, um, and to implement that vision. Um, and, and then that's where we see a lot of our success, just getting together, putting together a plan, don't let the plan stay on the shelf, um, and do what's authentic to your community. I think a lot of times, like one of the things that we've been doing is trying to collaborate with people in other communities too that have ideas. Right now we've got, um, we're working on a partnership with Grant Bowman from Oskaloosa because we realized that he's doing a lot of the same stuff there that we're trying to do here. So we thought it'd be a good idea to get together and exchange ideas and maybe expertises. Yeah, I say, don't be afraid to get people's opinions. See what that community wants and what they're looking for and like how you can make that plan to what they want and take that forward and then involve those community partners and the experts in those fields and have them be a part of the plan. That'll help build that excitement around that project or that event and make it even stronger. I think that's, those are all great. Um, that's all great feedback, great advice. I think also just um, understanding that uh, creative partnerships uh, this is a really great way to work with uh, potentially someone or a group that you hadn't thought of as a partner prior, whether it's another organization, but you may have similar priorities or a similar goal, um, individuals, groups, you name it, think of creative out of the box partnerships that you can help create. Uh, the more champions that you have for the project, talking about the momentum, talking about progress, helping rally uh, support throughout the community is really helpful. And finally, I would just say, just know there's going to be bumps along the road. That's part of it. And uh, you just can't stop believing in it and you can't stop pushing for it if you really believe this is the right thing for your community. 
and that there are enough people that have come around it to help make it happen. Just believe that it's going to get done one way or another. It may not look like what you originally thought, or it may be different than you originally planned, but that's okay too. That's part of the process and truly making it authentic to, to your own community. Great. Um, well, on that note, um, we'll wrap up here. So thank you to our panelists for participating in this discussion. And thank you, um, you know, from the Iowa Ideas event staff and the Gazette team. Uh, thanks to all of those of you in the audience who've listened in. Uh, we hope you join us for another session later today or on Friday. Uh, the next arts and culture session is a big idea roundtable session. Um, and it's a little, a little preview of that. Um, the description is, regardless of past success, arts and culture organizations across Iowa need to find new ways to build and engage their audience. How are organizations getting creative after several seasons of audience pivots? Uh, so uh, participants in that session will share some best practices and lessons learned. See you all later. Hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you.